Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bon Jovi, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Maya Weinstock. Maya is an editor, writer, and producer whose work has appeared in Scientific American, Discover, and Space.com. She is deputy editorial director at MIT News and a lecturer at MIT on the history of women in STEM. Maya is here with us today to discuss her new book, Carbon Queen, The Remarkable Life of Nanoscience Pioneer Mildred Dresselhaus. As a girl in New York City in the 1940s, Mildred Millie Dresselhaus was taught that there were few career options for women and virtually none in science. Yet over the course of a stunning career, Millie became a pioneering scientist and engineer whose work led to highly influential discoveries on the properties of carbon. Millie fundamentally shaped our understanding of carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes, graphene, and more. And as if this wasn't enough, Millie was also a trailblazer for women in STEM and a beloved educator, mentor, and colleague. We'll be digging into Millie's inspiring story today, and throughout our discussion, you might have some great questions popping into your head. So when you do, please go ahead and add them to the chat on the right. We'll have time shortly for Maya to answer some of these, so be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Maya, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So Mildred Dressel House is not nearly the household name that she deserves to be. Can you start by telling us who she is and, and what she's known for? Sure, absolutely. Um, Millie Dresselhaus was a longtime physicist and electrical engineer and materials scientist at MIT, where I now work. Um, she is known as the queen of carbon or a queen of carbon science um, because her career focused on understanding the properties of carbon and other uh, materials. And um, she is one of the founding nanoscientists who got in on the ground level of this area and so she had a large influence on the development of carbon science as we now know it. Um, many of her uh, discoveries have laid the foundations for other major discoveries that have become Nobel Prize winning and otherwise extremely influential in uh, solid state physics. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned that she really got in at the ground floor of nanoscience and her, her route there was, was maybe not necessarily obvious. What was her childhood like, sort of the early days? It's a great question. So Millie had a very difficult childhood. In fact, when I was writing this book, um, one of the surprising things to me was just how much poverty she experienced as um, a child growing up. Her parents were immigrants whose families basically both perished um, during the Holocaust. And so her, her, her two parents were able to escape before tensions got really bad. Um, and Unfortunately, they came at a not a great time. Um, you know, certainly they they survived, and that is we are very thankful for that. But they also came during the beginning of the Great Depression, and so you know they were immigrants living in New York City during the Great Depression. Um, and Millie's family, um, for a number of reasons, they made ends meet at the very beginning, but then through some various unlucky circumstances, um, became. Uh, they they ended up selling their business to uh, pursue an opportunity for Millie's uh, older brother. And then that opportunity sort of vanished right when they moved. So they lost kind of everything. Um, and so during Millie's childhood, she was growing up in a tenement house um, in kind of a dangerous neighborhood in the Bronx in New York City. And, you know, her family had a really hard time putting food on the table um, her father was sick much of the time, actually, um, and her mother ended up being the major breadwinner in the family. Um, you know, she had one pair of clothes that she would wear over and over. She had no toys. Um, and so just learning how she was able to overcome these very difficult circumstances. And also, of course, she was living at a time when women were not expected to become professionals. Um, so overcoming those obstacles is really, uh, it was a remarkable story as I learned it. And so that's one of the themes of the book is just overcoming these odds and um, kind of paying back to society later. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned there that Millie has this older brother and there was this opportunity that the family was seeking that kind of ended up vanishing. What were her family thinking about her prospects at this age and like the opportunities that she had? 
Um, so education was extremely important to Millie's family. They knew that any opportunity that she had to get, you know, become educated was something that they wanted her to take advantage of. And um, so the opportunity that her brother had was actually through music. He was a child prodigy on the violin. And she showed signs of being a prodigy as well when she was about four. Um, it wasn't necessarily that she could play the violin so young, but she had a really good uh, musical memory at that stage. And so she basically became a tag along where her brother had been going for free music lessons. And at this school, in, um, in she ended up going to the one that was in Greenwich Village. Um, they, she recognized many opportunities that her Bronx neighborhood did not afford her in terms of just like looking out into the world and seeing what other things were out there. Um, she would go see movies and write um, reviews for her school. And, you know, this this is something that she wouldn't have be able to afford otherwise. She also was oppor given the opportunity to see uh, plays and Broadway shows. Right. And these kinds of things opened her horizons a little bit. Yeah, that's amazing. She also, I think at a young age, she mentioned that her first paying job was uh, teaching a special needs student, which kind mm -hmm. of then foreshadows her her career as a remarkable educator. Was it something that she was just kind of a prodigy at as well? Or like what kind of drew her towards education so early? So in her um, the, her neighborhood schools that she was still attending just for a regular grade school, um, she was clearly sort of above and beyond all of her you know peers, or at least right. most of her peers. And um, you know, some of the teachers suggested that she try things like helping out as a teacher's assistant. And, and someone suggested, why don't you try helping out this other student? Um, and so I think she just gravitated towards taking that challenge on. And um, she learned how to teach really well through that one experience. And then later in high school, she became a very regular tutor to um, her peers. And people, people's parents would pay her pretty handily to do that. And she recognized very quickly that she had an aptitude for, um, for tutoring and teaching. And, you know, math and science were kind of her wheelhouse areas, but she would teach any subject. And she said that, you know, she would usually get the student an A in the class um, yeah. by teaching them how to learn. And so this definitely, you know, foreshadowed a bit how she ultimately became, um, a, you know, a college level professor. Yeah. Yeah. And so she spun sort of those early interests in, in teaching and, and math and science and was able to uh, go to university. Mm -hmm. What was the what was the situation like at that time for women uh, at a university and specifically women studying science? Um, great question. So Millie sort of had two strikes against her. One was that she was a girl at a time when girls were, again, not really given too many opportunities to go into professional careers. She said many times that she was given the expectation that if she wanted to try for a career, she could either be a nurse, a secretary, or a teacher, and that was it. Right. Um, but the other thing is that because she was so poor, her um, counselor wouldn't even recommend her for colleges. And so right. she actually tested into um, her through her regions exams. She received a scholarship to go to Cornell. But she assumed that she wouldn't be able to pay for it. So she didn't even bother applying. She just right. knew that she would. She actually went to um, a really well-regarded uh, public high school in New York City that you had to test into is Hunter College High School, which is still there, of course. And right. um, through that, you, at least at the time, automatically got an acceptance into Hunter College. So she kind of uh, she just went to Hunter because she thought that was the only opportunity available to her. But that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it was a wonderful thing. Hunter College was amazing for Millie. And in fact, many times she said that it was a turning point in her career and she might not have become the scientist that we knew and an engineer that we knew if she hadn't gone there. Yeah. And what was what about it was a turning point? Was it that she she found someone who kind of saw something in her or she saw something in herself? What was that? Um, so Millie took like every course that was offered to her and she, she had advanced standing when she got yeah. into college just through her really excellent grades. Um, but so that gave her an opportunity to take um, extra classes, so electives. 
And her sophomore year at Hunter, she took um, a basic like nuclear physics class, well, basic, but <laughs> nuclear right, physics right. class um, that was taught by Rosalind Yallow, who would later go on to win a Nobel Prize. Right. Now, um, Yallow had been also a Hunter alumna, and she was having a hard time finding a way to become a research scientist. She was also a brilliant physicist. Um, and she, you know, Yalo saw in Millie Dresselhaus immediately that she was also this brilliant woman who didn't really know about the opportunities that she could kind of tap into to go into a career in research or academia. So Rosalind Yalo really sort of put her arm around Millie and they, they became, you know, they were, it was an, an almost an instant mentorship and mm -hmm. Rosalind really pushed her, um, to the point where <laughs> Millie in the book, she, she's quoted as saying, you know, uh, Rosalind just kind of gave orders and I did basically what she said. <laughs> she didn't specify what area of science I should go into, but she said, you know, she saw that I had talent and I was interested in this and she really helped her see what opportunities were there for fellowships, for advanced study. And she really helped get her going into physics. Yeah. Yeah, and mentorship is such an important theme, I think, in her life, both her receiving mentorship and then later becoming a mentor to so many. When she was at university, uh, she one of her mentors was the physicist Enrico Fermi. How did she come to know Fermi and, and what kind of brought them together? It's a great question. So um, she basically, she took classes with him, but she also um, ended up walking to school with him often. And they, I guess, lived near each other and would walk down the same street and um, he would come over and invite her to chat with him on the way to class. Um, so this was something that, you know, really was formative to her, not only in the sense of what they were talking about, because clearly they were both fascinated by physics and science generally, but just the idea that this person who, I mean, this was at the end of Enrico Fermi's life and he had already become very famous around the world. Yeah. You know, he had already won a Nobel Prize and he was, you know, this eminent scholar coming over to a very young student who was already kind of um, unusual for being a woman at a time when, again, women were extremely unusual just in college campuses in general, but also especially in physics. I mean, there were certainly some other trailblazers before her, um, even at U of Chicago. But, um, you know, it, she was, I, my understanding is she was the only woman in her class. And so, you know, the fact that he would take her under her wing, his wing also, and, and give her a sense of um, belonging was really important. And she later paid that back. Um, and she, she mentioned his name many times and Rosalind Yalos too, um, as someone who she sort of, um, shaped her the way that she was mentoring her own students later on in her career. Yeah. Yeah. He also kind of shaped the way that she thinks about science in general. He sort of had this broad learning approach that, that Millie then encouraged her students as well to take on. How important was that in terms of the later success that Millie would have in science? Um, yeah. Fermi definitely gave her a sense of quote unquote, thinking like a physicist. Um, she felt that many of his lessons of understanding, um, like having a broad sense of the field that you're in and being able to kind of drop in and, you know, have perform inquiries in different, you know, realms um, was extremely valuable. And so not to get stuck too much into one area. And this became really important for her in a number of times in her career when she had, um, trajectories that sort of, you know, went into a different direction, not of her, necessarily of her, you know, choosing. Um, she had course corrections of things that she was asked to work on or, you know, funding went away for a certain type of, you know, material that she was working with um, that, you know, forced her to change how she was thinking about the stuff that she was studying. And she regularly would go back to her, the lessons that Fermi had taught her about just, you know, taking the little bit of what you already know and then applying it to a new area and really, to, you know, being able to thrive in that, in that way. Um, so that, that, it's, you know, she, she mentioned him again and again as someone who really um, was influential in that way in her career. Yeah. And so we spoke a little bit about the lack of horizons that she was seeing as a, as a child. And then at Hunter uh, college, she was seen as not necessarily uh, getting the advice that she would need moving forward. 
at university at Radcliffe College, she was then had a bunch of hurdles in her in her way as far as the culture for women in science there. Can you speak a little bit about that, about what it was like um, to be a woman in science at Radcliffe? Sure. Um, so Millie spent uh, a year at Radcliffe. Um, she was interested in in physics at the time. She had already decided that physics was going to be her course. And of course, you know, at the time, Radcliffe was not focused on science. So she took classes at Harvard, which is sort of the, the brother institution. And um, she definitely experienced, you know, um, kind of an unpleasant class in which the professor would always call on her, asking her to sort of summarize the previous class. Now, granted, she's a graduate student, right. and you know, this is not like a normal thing. She was almost right. being asked to be like a secretary, reading the notes back from the past right. meeting, um, and you know, it made her certainly made her uncomfortable um, in the sense that no other person in the class was being asked to do this, and she was the only woman in the class, and right. you know, it just seemed like, why are you picking on me? Um, so, um, but, you know, she did complete her master's and, um, I mentioned in the book that, you know, this is not uncommon at the time. Um, one of her contemporaries, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually attended Harvard very shortly after Millie. Um, and, and her, and she, she was a lawyer, of course, and yeah. um, in law school and, you know, uh, the late Justice Ginsburg had related very similar, you know, feeling of being like one of basically very, very few women at the time. Um, so it could be very lonely, um, but I, I will say that Millie had this, you know, confidence that got her through, I think. Um, and, you know, obviously she also had other people in her life, in her life just throughout her career that, you know, gave her a little boost to convince her that she could keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And you sort of touched on it a little bit there, but what was Millie's reaction in these situations? Like, was it just, I need to kind of hunker down and keep going or, or how did she see those? Yeah. I mean, she, she felt that if she couldn't handle these kinds of situations and, you know, they would come up again every now and then, whether, you know, as a PhD student or as a postdoc, um, you know, even early, very early in her career, like if she, if you couldn't handle sort of some of the attitudes that were given in her face about, you know, being right. a woman in science that obviously you couldn't have a career. So you could either kind of just deal with it and internalize it and move on, or you wouldn't be able to do it. And so Millie's personality really was to say, well, okay, you don't like me for one reason. I'm going to work around you and I'm going to figure out a way to do what I need to do. And, you know, like as an example, her graduate advisor at the University of Chicago felt strongly, and he was not the only one, many, many men in, at the time felt this way, that educating women in science was kind of a waste of time because they felt that women would leave the field and go on and have families and just, you know, those opportunities were quote unquote wasted. Um, and so, you know, Millie's advisor didn't even know, like he basically told her to get lost a number of times. And so she was like, all right, fine, I will get lost and do this myself. And so, you know, it was a little bit of a silver lining situation for her because she learned how to be very independent when it came to both research and also, you know, just finding colleagues who could help her. Um, and so she did that. And just the, the lessons that she learned from that helped just kind of steeled her mission. Like she just yeah. was like, I'm going to do it no matter what. And she was blessed with that up with that outlook. Um, but she also, of course, had people around her who were who were supporting her, too. Yeah. Yeah, and so she she made it through university. She did a postdoc, and then she eventually gets hired at MIT to teach. How unusual was MIT at that time in like the 1960s in terms of of hiring a diverse set of professors and their support for for women in STEM? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Millie joined the MIT faculty later on. She she joined them um, in 1967. So her first job, uh, which she took along with her husband and longtime physics colleague, Jean Dresselhaus, was actually at Lincoln Lab, which is um, uh, technically overseen by MIT, uh, but is a separate federally funded uh, institution. Um, so and it's you know, she wasn't teaching at the time. So um, so she, they began um, at Lincoln, and at the time she was one of only a couple of women who were on the um, on the research staff, um, at least on the science research staff. Um, so you know they hired a few people, but it was extremely rare. Um, and when she did join the MIT faculty, she was still one of only the few 
couple of people who were, um, I think she was only one of two engineering faculty. And, um, you know, there might have been a couple other science and, and other areas at MIT. Um, MIT, you know, ha has actually been one of the uh, pioneers in admitting women and having women on the faculty. Um, the first student that MIT had that was a woman was um, Ellen Swallow Richards, and she was a student in the late, eight, late 1870s or early 1870s. Forget the exact year that she graduated, but, um, you know, MIT sort of flirted with having women, um, it, you know, throughout that time. Um, so, you know, starting pretty early in the 1870s and onward, but really until the 1960s, it was, it was a bit haphazard. Um, and one of the things that Millie did when she did come onto the faculty was work with others to look at how to support women and really help grow the presence of um, female students and also female faculty members at MIT. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned there Millie's partner, Jean Dresselhaus, and they have quite a remarkable relationship uh, on a personal level. But I also want to hear a little bit about their relationship as physicists, because uh, Jean Dresselhaus was also um, a physicist as well. Yeah. So Jean was incredibly remarkable for being supportive of Millie and her career. Um, and they worked together really in so many ways. I mean, clearly they were husband and wife and they had four children together. Um, and but they were doing that at a time when, you know, Millie and Jean were really starting their careers as well. Um, and I'll just give one anecdote, which kind of gives you a sense of of this support that Jean always gave to Millie. And that is just from the very beginning of her career. Um, you know, Millie had earned a postdoc position at Cornell, and and she went there specifically because Jean had become a young faculty member there. He was a, you know, assistant professor of physics. Right. And when the postdoc was up, you know, there was a big question: Well, what what is Millie going to do now? Because you know, um, her funding had run out. Um, and so she, they were trying to get her to somehow be hired by Cornell, whether you know, as a assistant professor or just a research professor or a researcher that not teaching and they were not interested. Um, and she also just volunteered to become a, a scientist who was not getting paid. Um, right, right. And they were like, nope, we're really sorry, but we can't. And they had these, and Cornell was not alone in this, You know, they had what were known as nepotism laws where they wouldn't hire um, a husband and wife team at the same time, uh -huh. even if they were both completely deserving and like, you know, you know, uh, capable of doing the work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to his great credit, Gene said, you know what, well, I'll go somewhere else. I will give up my plum faculty position because, you know, he clearly saw that Millie had, a, she was brilliant and she, you know, had an opportunity to have her own research career. And so they decided to move and they ended up going to, um, to MIT and you know the rest is kind of history, but it just got, goes to show just how much he really wanted to back her her whole career. He also, um, you know, they worked together a little bit at the beginning uh, when they were both at Lincoln. And then when Millie went off to the MIT faculty, they still were in close contact in terms of their research, um, but they weren't on all the papers together at the same time. Yeah. But then when they later, he later then joined the MIT faculty or the uh, MIT research staff later. And then from that point, he was one of her most common uh, co-authors on her many, many papers. She had like 1700 papers. Right. Yeah. But, so they were, you know, and he's a co-author on, on the books that they wrote together. So, you know, they really were an amazing team. And then at home, of course, like he actually also, according to the families that I talked to, you know, was unusual at, at the time for supporting her at home and, you know, did half of the chores and half of the, you know, dealing with the kids and making sure all their needs were met and all that. So he was unusual in many, many ways. And um, he unfortunately just passed away very recently and a few months ago. Um, but, you know, he and Millie really had a wonderful career together as physicists. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they were really one of these teams that is really the team is more than like the sum of the parts, uh, which is very impressive. Absolutely. <laughs> Spe speaking on Millie's uh, sort of research efforts and, and the scientific contributions that she made, uh, she was influential in our understanding of carbon, as you've mentioned. What was her research area and, and how did she kind of get drawn into it? Um, good question. So uh, when she first started at Lincoln, she her, her thesis had been on superconductivity, um, which is a uh, when you have materials that uh, conduct electricity without any resistance. 
And so she originally thought that she might work in that area. Um, but her boss at the time basically said, well, we just figured out all the major problems with superconductivity. So I don't want you to work in that area. So you need to start, you need to find something else. And she decided to start working in semi-metals. Um, at the time, there was a lot of work being done on semiconductors because uh, you know, there was a lot of question about like, how are these going to affect the development of computing technologies and computing machines? Um, and so she, st she did a little bit of research on, on semiconductors, um, but she found that the elements that were, you know, the, se the semiconductor materials were a little bit similar to each other. And she felt that once she researched one, that they were so similar that they weren't so interesting to her. Um, yeah. And, you know, Gene had in his background, in his earlier studies, um, felt that there was something strange and potentially very interesting going on with carbon. Um, right. So he actually suggested that she study carbon uh, and she, you know, took the challenge. Carbon was a, a material that um, most people thought was too difficult to really understand, actually. And they also thought that nothing interesting was going to come out of it. Right. Um, so she thought that was a great challenge. Um, and when this decision was being made, she also was in the throes of being a mom to four kids who are all very young. And so she and Jean decided, you know, this is a great avenue because A, you know, if we find some really neat physics, you know, we will have an opportunity to be sort of at the forefront of this field, and which is exactly what happened. Um, but also at the same time, she wouldn't have to worry if she wouldn't have as much competition because nobody else was looking at carbon. So, you right. know, she did take a couple of days off because her kids were sick. Um, you know, that was helpful to her. And so, so for those reasons, she ended up looking at the carbon. Um, but throughout her career, she has really been focused on um, the various properties of carbon. Um, so her grandfather actually um, was, he studied carbon in the sense that he was a diamond dealer. So diamond right. is one form of carbon and, um, it is very different in the sense of its atomic structure from uh, another pure form of carbon, which is the lead that you find in pencils. And Millie started her career looking into graphite, which is essentially what you find in a, in a pencil. Um, and so she wanted to know what, um, what the electronic properties of carbon were at the time. And really nobody had looked into this. And so she is one of the founding, you know, uh, people who really helped discover and and genes uh, together as well. Um, you know what? How electricity runs through carbon materials. Um, she was looking at the various layers of carbon atoms and seeing what might happen if you stir in bits of other materials in carbon, and that just kind of like led to a whole flowering of other um, developments and discoveries about other forms that. As I, as I said later earlier in this talk, um, led to Nobel Prizes and, and have now kind of been developed into technologies that are all around us. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that there was interest in general in uh, sort of the semiconductor world and the impact that it could have on computing. Mm -hmm. And Millie was interested in the properties of carbon, specifically their conductivity. Was she looking at conductivity just because it was interesting to her or was it because that was sort of what people were investigating due to computing or were those unrelated? Um, I don't think there was a sense at the time that there would be, I don't think she thought, you know, maybe carbon could be used in, in a computer or, or right. in some kind of transistor. Um, of course, we do have carbon um, now in computing machines, like in cell phone batteries and flat screen displays and all sorts of things. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I mean, it, it's it was the kind of basic research that I don't think she was necessarily looking towards very specific, tangible um, right. ways of you know applying her work. But that was what really drew her to that work because when you're doing basic research, that means you're looking into the fundamental properties that can be applied in so many different ways. And I think that's one of the reasons why she's not as well known because she didn't make discoveries that led to something very specific. She right. made discoveries that were sort of before those discoveries right. without which they, the other ones wouldn't have happened. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that she was doing these investigations and then she started to discover some interesting properties that, that various um, carbon structures have. Mm -hmm. At that time, was it then an effort from her to kind of get the word out about these things or did she sort of 
say these things and then there was kind of a rush of interest or what was yeah, that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, this was the days before the internet and, yeah. um, you know, science communication was very different back then. Um, having conferences was not as easy as it is now. Um, there were no cell phones. There was no, there's nothing, everything was just analog, right? right. So um, she was, you know, one of the first people organizing like carbon uh, conferences that look specifically at carbon. Um, but, you know, before that, there were bubbles of research happening in the areas that she later kind of followed up on that people, you know, didn't really pick up on for one reason or another. So um, it's just kind of a very interesting history of science, which you know was one of the things I was really fascinated by when I was doing my research for the book, just how we learned about you know um, carbon nanotubes and you know graphene and how people back in like the early 50s were actually looking into like theoretical you know models of these things, but either they were like way off in another country and you know they were writing in another language that nobody was really you know, connecting with them very easily on, um, or there was no conferences, so the papers weren't being shared. Um, so, you know, when Millie started working in graphite, graphite um, was the 1970s. And so, you know, she started um, going to conferences more, but it was slow going. It's not like it was today where you can go to a conference every week and, you know, um, yeah. that's not a problem. So, um, yeah, it was it was definitely slower going early on, but she was, as I said, in on the ground floor and she made so many contacts um, throughout her career that, you know, um, her Rolodex was huge and <laughs> was actually um, a graphic in the toward the end of my book that one of her former students or maybe as a former postdoc made that is like a chart of all of her um, colleagues who were co-authors on her papers. And it was something like, 5,000 nodes and it's just right. the people are all over the world. And certainly that was um, made easier by technology as we got into like fax machines, which she right. like used the fax machines constantly <laughs> in the eighties and the nineties. Um, yeah. and, and of course the internet and email. Um, so, but it was definitely harder as it would have been for any scientist, um, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And was there any, any pushback on her work where sort of, because she was a woman in STEM, that there was maybe pushback from that regard, or just because of the nature of her work, was there any pushback? I don't think got the sense that there was pushback on her work yeah. because she was a woman. Um, there might have been some opportunities that she wasn't offered because she was a woman, but um, I mean, she, you know, Millie was brilliant and she knew what she was yeah. talking about and she could easily defend it. There were a number of times where she made discoveries that flew in the face of the current thinking of whatever you know um, system she was looking specifically at. And, you know, I give a couple of examples of that where whether it was talking about, you know, where electrons and these other charge carriers called holes were in the material of graphite, she basically completely upended that. And then there was another discovery later with carbon nanotubes that suggested that um, she predicted that if depending on the placement of the atoms in carbon nanotubes, that the, the, the conductivity would be different. And in both of those cases, people didn't believe it. And they were like, that's crazy. Um, so, you know, but she, she had to have a, an inner strength, but she also was very confident in their work and she was a good, excellent scientist. So they rechecked and, you know, they redid their experiments many times. And um, so I don't think she really got, you know, um, slack for being a woman in, when it came to her research. Um, right. I think people were extremely inspired by her, if anything. Um, and, you know, she helped many women and individuals of color who are underrepresented in their fields feel welcome. Um, and so uh, I think that was a, a major part of her her legacy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also in terms of feeling welcome, I guess there's the uh, story that you mentioned about when she publishes her work on, I think it was the electron holes. And then there's sort of this immediately afterward, there's a flood of, of sort of other labs that are that are verifying these results, almost as if there was this fear that that it just seems so wrong. And then you get that one voice out there and all of these others follow. That's right. Yeah. It was such a wonderful example of just her tenacity. And she wasn't yeah. the only one on the paper. She was a few people on it. But, um, you know, uh, this this early paper was one of her first papers. Um, and she, you know, was actually, they were the people in the journal refused initially to uh, uh, publish it because they th said, we already know where the electrons and holes are. And one of the reviewers actually came out and privately 
you know, um, it revealed himself to be a friend and colleague and said, he said, Millie, you know, you're going to ruin your career. If you post publish this, are you sure you want to do this? And she said, you know, I appreciate the concern, but we've done the research. I'm willing to ruin my career. We would like to publish it. And so he did. And as you said, you know, um, all of these other researchers who had had this um, work that they had done that did not make sense in, in the light of the established system suddenly right. took out their old work yeah. that was buried in a lab somewhere. And they were like looking at it again and saying, you know what, this actually makes sense now. <laughs> you know, right. so really turned it around. But yeah, you absolutely have to be um, confident in, in what you're doing and that those kinds of uh, uh, discoveries are, I mean, it was one that she, Millie told many, many times over her career. And it was one that I think she tried to give confidence to people to like stick with your guns. And, you know, even if you're a young, just person's just starting out, you can still make a huge contribution to your field. Um, and that was, you know, just so like Millie, just trying to encourage the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. And on that point of encouraging the next generation, you have a story again of she's uh, almost uh very giving in terms of the ideas that she's she's thinking about and the the areas of of research that could be pursued and she had students that she would present them problems that they could then go and look into and would become these influential areas of of research was that something that was common at the time or was she unusual in terms of her freedom of spreading ideas around um, that's a good question. I mean, I didn't do a survey of, you know, of her colleagues at the time just to see like how many would sort of hoard the idea, right, right. how many would kind of just give them away. But I mean, I think she was such a busy person and she was always thinking about her science. Um, and also she was as a professor, you know, always thinking about how she could help others that she was working with. So it really was extremely common for her to just have, you know, um, a thought idea uh, come to her, or she would meet someone at a conference and they she would say, oh, I know this other person who had a very similar thought, why don't you work with them? And some magical paper would come out of it and change the world, you know? She had these ideas all, all the time. So, and you know, she didn't get credit for those kinds of um, inspirational uh, uh, idea making, you know, uh, thoughts, but yeah. you know, people became to love her because in part because she was so uh, inspirational in that way. And she was just a font of ideas when it came to various research areas that, you know, um, she became sort of a den mother in her field. She also, I will just note that, you know, at conferences and in, in journals, she would often write sort of reviews of what has been known in the field to date and what is, you know, what they're looking ahead to. And so um, and at the end of conferences, she might give like the end talk that was like, okay, what did we learn? We heard from this person, we heard from this person and what's next, you know? So she really was this um, consummate educator and someone who, you know, whether in her class at MIT or just generally um, in her field was constantly looking ahead, trying to synthesize what was known about the physics of whatever materials she was working on. And really just like, inspirationally think ahead to what could we really do with with what we know and you know what what else is possible yeah yeah so she's she's certainly this this brilliant physicist and researcher and then she also is uh raising a small family and integrating those two quite difficult things to juggle but then on top of that she's also taking on quite a lot of effort in terms of mentorship and trying to uh, increase opportunities for women and minorities what was her perspective on that sort of mentorship and advocacy work was that something that she felt a responsibility to do or or was drawn to just naturally what was she thinking about that um i think in some ways she did feel a little bit of a responsibility um in part because she was given so much when she was a young and very um poor student frankly poor of money um and she received so many opportunities early on. I mean, like literally going back to when she was in music school, she had an opportunity to um, meet Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Eleanor right. would come in occasionally, listen to the students play at her music school. And, and she saw Eleanor, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt, get, you know, as a, as a role model of like someone who really gave back. Um, and so I really do think that she, she felt a little bit of a responsibility um, she also, when she joined the MIT faculty, she did so as a result of a um, 
a visiting professorship that was paid for um, specifically for women to be on the faculty as an opportunity to kind of try to give women a chance to start, you know, being part of academia. Right. This began a time where, you know, many, many influential colleges still didn't even accept women generally um, in their in their student body. So um, so she definitely felt that she needed to uh, do something to kind of address the fact that she was given this opportunity specifically and that she, you know, really wanted to pay back by lifting others. And she did this in so many ways. She at MIT um, specifically, and then also in other places, but at MIT, she helped start something called the Women's Forum, which was an opportunity for um, people around the Institute, both students, faculty members, staff, wives of uh, faculty members to kind of connect and, you know, talk about issues that were important to them. And in some cases, um, make changes that would, you know, make them more inclusive, more included, and also just support them more. Um, and then like later on, when she became someone who had opportunities to, um, uh, you know, perform service uh, as like a national leader. So for instance, she she gave back as president or, you know, she was a member, but then later she became president of many um, national organizations um, in science. So she was president of AAAS. Um, she was president of the American Physical Society. She was chosen to um, head the Office of Science of the U.S. Department of Energy. So she gave, she had all these opportunities to connect and, um, she, you know, lift people who, you know, historically had not been given opportunities in, in the sciences. And so she did this throughout her career in many different ways. Um, and, you know, both at MIT and around the country and, and indeed around the world, I would say, she really had a positive influence in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that she she had so many avenues that she was supporting others and creating these opportunities through. In terms of deciding the things that she wanted to do in order to try and support others, was there a conversation at the time about the types of things that should be done? Or was it something that she just kind of had intuition about? Or how did she get to to do all of these things? Yeah, well, Millie, toward, especially toward the end of her career in the last couple of decades, was constantly being asked for, to do things. And, you know, some were requests and others were um, you just, you know, awards and things she was given uh, recognition for. And so I think at a certain point, um, she felt, I think, toward the beginning of her career that she had this opportunity to, you know, really make an outsized influence in uh, supporting women and other underrepresented groups in the STEM fields um, by, you know, creating a class that made it more likely for students who didn't have any background in engineering to know what engineering was and um, to take those and, and and potentially either major or have even a minor in those classes. But then later on, you know, she, as I said, she was given opportunities to go speak at colleges or or institutions. And, you know, clearly she had some choices because she probably couldn't have possibly done everything. Although, trust me, I'm sure she would have tried to do everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was just indefatigable. She just, you know, had this amazing energy. But yes, I think she absolutely selected um, opportunities that would give her the chance to, you know, if, if, if she accepted um, a certain honorary degree, she would make sure that she had a chance to speak with the students there. And especially if there was a women in science group there, she would go speak with them. Um, if there was an award she was given, she would request to be on the uh, committee that decided the next you know, recipients. And that way she could insert herself into the conversation in terms of um, representation that way. So, you know, um, I think quietly she made quite a huge difference uh, in our country in terms of, you know, acceptance of women in, in the various STEM fields. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that she had all of these different avenues, some of them, quote unquote, small, where she's doing this sort of person to person mentorship. And then there's other opportunities such as her presidency at the American Physical Society. What kind of things was she looking to do, at, like at the presidency for APS? Um, I mean, there's obviously APS is a really large organization and it's extremely broad. So Millie's background was in solid state physics. But as president of APS, she was representing people from astronomy to nuclear science to, you know, to her area of condensed matter physics. Um, so part of it was just kind of to like get a broad view of, you know, the, the focus areas that the, yeah. you know, APS wanted to, to you know, uh, spend time on. 
But she also really always, did, and this was something that came up again and again, regardless of the, the organization, um, she really looked for opportunities to advance uh, young people and make sure that there was sort of um, a pipeline that, you know, uh, would, would ensure that young people were getting some experience so that later when they were a mid-career, they could take on leadership roles. And that she thought this was really important because, you know, that was kind of what had been done for her. Um, and then, you know, obviously also um, the education aspect was important to her since she was an educator. She was um, interested in science communication. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, some of the more pressing issues were like, what are we going to do with the budget? You know, that's right, a major right. problem that, you know, when you're a president of something um, you, you, you work on. But I think some of these other issues were extremely important to her. And she spent a lot of time, you know, advocating for as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so Millie's story, as we've kind of seen, has these remarkable arcs to it. What was your kind of journey to finding Millie and, and wanting to write a story about her? <laughs> um, so I first learned about Millie when I was um, a young science reporter at Discover Magazine. Um, Millie was one of 50 women that the magazine Discover was um, deciding to write an article on as, you know, the top 50 women in science at the time. And um, I was just researching the article. So I remember, you know, reading about her and I inevitably contacted her. I barely remember that, but I do remember right. her name. And um, later when I joined the MIT staff, um, you know, I heard her name a lot more and I, you know, saw her around a little bit. And then I actually, um, you know, had started to hear her about her much more in popular science, um, just uh, seeing articles about her like every fall, wondering whether she might win a Nobel Prize. Right. Um, and she would win other prizes as well. And so, you know, I really wanted to know like what made her tick. And um, I was just very fascinated by her. Um, I also, though, I, I met her only one time, and it was because I had made a Lego minifigure of her. Right, uh, right. One of my sort of side hobbies is making um, custom designed Lego people of actual scientists and engineers. They tend to be women, um, not always, but they do tend to be more often. And so I just emailed her and asked her, you know, I just mentioned that I had this thing and could I stop by sometime just to give it to her. And she was super gracious. She actually said, you know, I actually have a printout of the photo of it. It's been sitting on my bulletin board for however long and, you know, it attracts attention. <laughs> so, wow, <laughs> yeah. I already know about my stuff. Um, so I went down the next day and she, you know, invited me into her office. Um, she was extremely gracious. I thought it would take like five minutes, but we were there for like half an hour talking okay. about everything from, you know, being from New York and um, just interest in women in science and her travels. And, you know, I was definitely starstruck at the time. So I honestly don't remember a whole lot of what we were yeah, talking yeah. about. Um, and I certainly was not thinking about writing a book about her at the time. Um, but, you know, she did pass away, unfortunately, um, in 2017 in February, and she was 86 at the time. And a few months later, I was approached by um, my colleague, Jeremy Matthews, who um, was working on uh, a new project to kind of um, uh, assign some biographies uh, of women in science um, for the MIT Press. And he floated a few names of ideas um, of people and he wondered whether I might be interested in writing a book. And when he mentioned Millie, I just kind of jumped at the opportunity to, to write about her because I was already just intrigued by her life. and just the fact that she was still doing research well into her 80s. I mean, she never really retired. She became right. emerita um, in, I think, I want to say it was 2007, I think. Right. I should double check the math, but <laughs> yeah. but she never really officially retired. So, um, you know, it's uh, it was just wonderful reading. You know, we, we produced articles about her work well into her 80s. And um, so that's kind of how it started. Yeah, that's remarkable. <laughs> and we have a question from the audience that kind of ties into this. So Sophia says, thank you for coming today, Maya. While writing your book, what was something that surprised you during your preparation and research? Oh, OK. Thanks for the question, Sophia. Um, well, a few things surprised me, but I would say probably the two most um, the two most surprising elements were one, just the depths of pro the poverty that she came from and her ability to kind of overcome it. Um, 
And then I really was surprised um, by, in part of that is being surprised by like the person, her personality came out really well in terms of um, some of the looking, you know, anecdotes she gave looking back at her early career. Um, like she, because she didn't have any money, but she was just very interested in science and frankly, in all culture, um, she would sneak around and, and, you know, go into museums without paying because she didn't have money. So she would yeah. figure out a way to sneak in. And, um, you know, uh, the same with, with Broadway shows. She snuck into all these Broadway shows and figured it out. And, um, you know, it, it just kind of, it looked ahead to her ability to kind of just say, well, I'm interested in doing this. So I'm going to figure out a way to do it one way or another. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she also just had this sense of humor that I didn't really know about as much before I really looked into her background. Um, but then the other thing that really surprised me was um, how much music was important to her. Um, I didn't know anything about the fact that music really launched her career in the sense that without her music lessons as a child, she might not have known about Hunter College High School and she might not have, you know, really been able to go to Hunter College and then she right. might not have met, you know, um, Rosalind Yellow, who really encouraged her. So, but then later in her career, she, um, she played music constantly. She was organizing um, chamber groups where she right. would play violin or viola. Um, it was just such an important part of her, her life and her family's life. She would play music when she did um, a fellowship, a Fulbright fellowship, um, when she was just a young student. Uh, she played music at MIT when she was an early faculty member and would, you know, according to one of her students, you know, start a new tradition of just like playing a, like a little concerto or whatever before <laughs> a, an engineering talk. Um, and yeah. this is something that she just became known for. And I really had no idea about that. So that was very surprising. I actually got a chance to go to her former house. And um, when, you know, um, her, her family still is there or, or owns it and um, they showed me around and, you know, her living room is still completely like full of music stands and yeah. um, just instruments. And it's clear that like music is ex was an extremely important part of her life. And, you know, just knowing that is um, gives a little bit of extra depth to her, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it also makes you wonder where she possibly found the time to fit in all of this. I know. Well, one of her, her longtime assistants said that actually her music calendar was as sacred as the daytime calendar to her. And so right. she made the time for the music. So, um, but how she did it all, sometimes <laughs> I still do not know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, as we start to wrap up, Millie obviously had such an impact on science and then also on um, the uh, opportunities for women and minorities in STEM. What was she thinking towards her later years, towards the end of her life, about the world in regards to women in STEM? Was she positive on it or not so much? Or what was she thinking? I think she was positive on it. I think she felt um, that so much had um, improved in her, over her lifetime. Um, I think she, uh, you know, she maybe wasn't sure like what the next level would be. I know she was, she starred in this um, ad that sort of celebrated her life and t t thought about like, what if we treat, you know, women in science as celebrities. And I don't think she really understood how social media has played actually a really important role in helping to support women and other under underrepresented groups, especially women who are a, a part of one of those other represented groups. Right. Um, and uh, so I think she was, you know, optimistic, um, but also had a realistic, she, you know, she had three, uh, she had five grandkids and several of them are, are actually coming up in the STEM fields themselves. And so they were able to give her also, you know, right. um, some feedback on areas that still need some work. But um, I think in general, she felt like, you know, we, we have come a long way and you do kind of have to, you know, be proud of what she's done for, um, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's that's all the time we have. Maya, I want to thank you again for joining us. It's been absolutely fantastic having you here and, and sharing Millie's story with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great, always great to talk about Millie, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Definitely, yeah. Maya's book, Carbon Queen, is available now wherever books are sold, including through your local and independent bookseller. It really is a fun and inspiring story, and I, I definitely recommend everyone check it out. For everyone who joined us, we look forward to seeing you at our next Toxic Google event. Take care.